I would literally be sitting on my kitchen floor and just be sobbing and then tell God, like, this is awful and my heart hurts so bad, but thank you that I'm healthy and thank you that my kids are healthy and thank you that I have a place to live. And I just would start making these lists of things to be thankful for. That's, that's what really got me through. Welcome to The Bright Side of Life a podcast where people share their personal stories of struggles, pain, and grief, but through all of that, they are still able to find the joys in life. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of The Bright Side of Life. I am your host, Melissa Bright. I just want to start off by saying thank you guys so much for all the support that you have already given me. I've only been doing this a couple weeks, and the response has been absolutely incredible. So if you do enjoy my podcast, I would greatly appreciate it if you would leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. I do think that they are the only directory right now that has that option to leave a review. But thank you very much. Today, I am talking to Nikki, who's going to share her story of the seasons of life and how she embraces that and she continues to grow each day. Nikki, thank you so much for being here. So tell me where your story starts. My story starts in 2001. I was 14 years old and going into my freshman year of high school, I had an older sister who was going to be a senior in high school that year. And it was the weekend before the school year started. We had just got back from vacation from Florida and she had gone out that night and about one o'clock in the morning, we get a phone call. Um, and I answered the phone back when you had just like the one house phone. So I ran throughout the house, grabbed the phone. Um, and it was my sister's friend like yelling frantically that she had been in a car accident and my parents needed to get to mercy. And so come to find out the next day, visit my sister in the hospital. And she had been in a car accident with this drunk driver and she had suffered a severe traumatic brain injury to her frontal lobe and also had a lot of shattered fractured bones. She had injuries to like internal organs and when I saw her the next day in the ICU she was unrecognizable and needless to say she was in the hospital for or in the ICU in a coma for six weeks and then in the hospital for another three months. And then she was in rehab for a year. Had to relearn everything. Wow. How was that for you being a sibling? You know, what was family life like that after she was in her accident? It was completely different from what we had known. So Shannon had always been this really bubbly, independent person and just always had a lot going for her. And when that happened, she became completely dependent on everybody in our family. So my mom just lived at the hospital and my stepdad was the one that was home. My granny came to live with us for about a year to help take care of Shannon and help take care of us when my mom wasn't there because she was at the hospital. Um, So life became, at that point, I had to be pretty independent. You know, my parents were still there and still supported and provided, but it was all the emotion, emotional support that we needed was Mm -hmm really, you know, rightfully so given to Shannon. And because it was, you know, a traumatic experience. It was during that time, starting high school, that I had to be more independent. It was harder. After the accident, when she finally came home, we had to rearrange our entire house. You know, my parents moved their bedroom downstairs into the basement. We had to have all this extra equipment in our restroom so that we could get Shannon in and out of the shower. Um, Our whole world basically revolved around her and her recovery. And I'm not upset by that at all. Actually, it um, inspired me in a lot of ways and gave me some really awesome insight into what it means to have a family member suffer such a significant medical injury. And that's really shot me in the direction of where I am nowadays with my career. So what do you do now as far as your career? Yeah, so I'm an occupational therapist. Most people, when I say that, they're like, oh, cool. And they don't really know what it is. They think I find jobs for people. (laughs) Um, Ultimately, an occupational therapist, my job is to help people regain independence from what they have recently gone through. So I've worked at a skilled nursing facility with elderly people trying to recover from, you know, a fall and get back home um, or 
a stroke. I've worked in the inpatient hospital, people just there for a couple of days needing to get on their feet. But Shannon's accident really showed me that I want to help people in that acute rehab setting. So I did work for a few years at a local rehab hospital in the stroke and amputee unit. And I loved being that person that got the patient from the hospital to the rehab hospital. And it was maybe the first time they had seen themselves in the mirror since whatever had happened to them. And it was more than likely the first time they had put real clothes on, you know, in days or months even. And I got to be that person that said, listen, I know you didn't ask for this. I know that this is not how you thought your life was going to go, but I'm here for you and with you. And we're going to work on this and get you back home and get you back on that path of you being you again, because that's what I saw the therapists do and my family do for Shannon. That is awesome. Going back to when you were younger and after Shannon's accident, um, was there anything else that happened in your life? Anybody else that you turned to, you know, since your parents were taking care of Shannon? Yeah. Um, I had some really, really awesome friends that we had grown up together since we were tiny in the same neighborhood. And um, my best friend, Philip, he was the one who just for years had constantly bothered me about going to church. And for years, my mom, my sisters and I on Wednesday nights were like, nope, we're watching Dawson's Creek. And, you know, <laughs> But we were watching all the shows instead of doing anything else. And that was like our time together. But after Shan's accident, obviously we didn't have that. And so I finally gave it a shot to go to church with Philip. And it was the spring after her accident that I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm desperate for strength outside of myself and I don't have it. And, you know, this is going to be a long road for my sister and my family. And so I think it was the second time, second night that I finally went to church with Philip and, you know, everything that the speaker was saying was about God's our strength. He's our source. He's our provider. And I was like, this God knows exactly what I need. This is crazy. Like, <laughs> nope, what I need except for him. And he's so good. And they sang um, a song. I don't know if you know it, but it's called Your Love, O Lord. And one of the, it's a third day song, um, an oldie but a goodie. And one of the lines in the song is, I'll find my strength in the shadow of your wings. And I think I heard that and I was like, oh, like that is exactly what I need. I need somebody else just to like come around and say, like, I've got you. Yeah, that's when I came to know God and know that, you know, he knows exactly what I need. Did you continue going to church um, continuously or? <laughs> yeah, my mom actually, so shortly after my sister, my younger sister started going with us too. It was like the whole neighborhood was going to the same youth group. And, um, and my mom actually thought we were really, really weird because we would go to church on Wednesday nights. We would go to like other youth groups on Friday nights. And then we go to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night, just because that's where all of our friends were. And I think at that time, I just wanted everything that you know God had for me. So I was always there. You know, like you said, it kind of gave you, well, first of all, it gave you strength and then it gave you, you didn't feel alone. You know, you got more emotional support. So so I think that was obviously exactly where you were supposed to be. And it provided this community outside of my family that I, I don't think I had ever really opened myself up to. Um, my family growing up didn't go to church and didn't, we stayed, we were very close with other family members, but we didn't really branch out to neighbors or people outside of our family. So that yeah. was my first yeah. real like taste of people that became family that weren't actually biological family. So it was, it was, it was awesome. I loved my experience in youth as a younger kid in yeah, college. That's a really good story. Fast forwarding a little bit, when you were 21, I know something else major happened in your life. So if you can share um, what happened when you were 21. Yeah. So um, when I was 21, we had gotten engaged the Thanksgiving before, and it was March of uh, the year that we were supposed to be getting married. And my mom and dad were going through a divorce and it was kind of a long drawn out thing at least that's what it felt like to me but i was in my first year of ot school shout out to uh, maryville university mm -hmm. uh, and it was like a really professional program so you know you had to be on every day and um, i really appreciate that now as a professional occupational therapist but when all this happened it was kind of crazy so one day my dad came over and he said he he wanted to have a chat which was really unusual because we weren't very close and he sat down on the couch and I I was on the other couch in my apartment with my roommate. I was roommates with this girl I didn't really know, but she was in her room. And uh, he's like, 
do you know how much I love you? And I kind of looked at him with like this bewildered face and really trying to answer, trying to think of a nice answer in my head because I was like, uh, and I actually said, I was like, no, because we weren't very close, you know, never really had like a great talking relationship. But so I said, do you know how much I love you? And I was like, uh, no. And he's like, I've loved you since the day I met you. And then he kind of paused and he said, and I met you when you were two weeks old. And I, you know, kind of like took this deep breath and was like, I don't know what you're saying and why you're saying it. And he continued to talk. And the only thing I can think, the only thing I can remember from it is just basically like, he's not my dad and they've kept this secret from me my entire life. And I just want to know the truth. So I couldn't talk to my mom that night because I just was too overwhelmed by, you know, that type of news. But come to find out a couple, like within a week or so, um, she said, yeah, you know, he's not your dad. And you know, he did adopt you after him and I were married and after your sister was born. And, you know, he never wanted you to know any difference. And so that's why we never told you. But come to find out since then, you know, that whole issue was the root of a lot of family situations that we had, um, a lot of, you know, division. But yeah, I found out that I was adopted by him. And so that really changed in my head. It changed everything, but it really didn't change anything, if that makes any sense. Like, so my, all my my other siblings technically were half siblings and you know he wasn't really my dad but they really were the people that were around my entire life and made up my family that I knew right. so, and part of it too I found out when my mom had a really honest chat with me she's like yeah I, um, I, I had three kids already and I you know had gone out with one of my girlfriends and turns out she was um, drugged at a party and was raped and that's how I became to be and she said, you know, I, I, when I found out I was pregnant, I didn't necessarily want to have another child. And, but after I decided, you know, I'm going to go through with this, I'm not going to have this child. She said that she felt this whisper in her heart that was like, it's not her fault or it's not the baby's fault. Like the baby didn't do that. You know, this is just something that, something that happened. And so she decided to keep me and that's how I became to be. Through that, I learned, it really showed me that, you know, God has a plan for my life, that if there wasn't a purpose and a plan for my life, I believe that I wouldn't actually exist. So did you have any uh, anger at all at that time (laughs) when you found out? (laughs) Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I was mad that everybody knew. I mean, the people that I worked with at the time, I worked at a a doctor's office that my mom had worked at for 20 years. And then she moved to Florida and I still worked at that doctor's office. And when I came to work the next day, um, because I wanted to act like everything was fine, you know, and just keep on moving with my life. You know, I told them, I'm like, hey, I found this out last night. And they're like, oh, we know. And so it it did make me really angry that people knew and didn't tell me or didn't think I could handle it or, you know, thought it would change the way I view, I guess, my stepdad or other people in my life. I don't Mm -hmm. know. So yeah, I was, I was pretty upset, but I think the whole, the whole reason he told me was because they were going through a divorce and he thought that that would skew me to kind of side with him and it really backed up because she was she's the one I had the relationship with and the one that I actually trusted and knew loved me so it didn't work out too good (laughs) yeah did you find yourself at that time in your life leaning more to God for sure yeah I mean so we got married in October 2008 and it probably didn't hit me until we were pregnant with our first son in 2012 when I started going to those appointments and the doctor was asking, what, what runs in your family? And I could tell him everything about my mom's side. I could tell him everything about my husband's parents, both sides. But when it came to my biological father's side, I had no clue. And I was really upset at how embarrassed I was to say, like, I don't know. And then they would ask, you know, oh, did he pass away? And like, I just never knew him. And so during that time, um, I had to really process, you know, God really ministered to my heart and and showed me that it doesn't matter who that person biologically is. Like, I've got you. And I, I know, I know what your history is. And I know that I'm your provider and I'm going to be your child's provider too. So you don't have to worry about any of that. Like we're going to, it's going to be okay. Yeah. So that's, that's where I really learned that as corny as it sounds, that God is my father and has provided me so much. It doesn't sound corny. I 
don't know. Some people, some people might think it is, but that's no, just, it, that's it helps you, but it's so awesome that it helps you. You know, I mean, it's great. I think it's great. Let's jump to present day now. You recently went through a divorce. And if you can just tell me what that was like, where you were then to where you are today and your beautiful life today. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. I was actually introduced to BetterHelp by my boyfriend because earlier this year, I was in such a deep, dark depression and I didn't know what to do. I had to literally text him to tell him what was going on with me because I was so ashamed that I was sad and I I didn't even want to ask for help and texting was the easiest way that I could do that. And that night, we literally signed me up to do better help. That's just a little bit of my story. And I feel like if this can help somebody else with struggling of feeling alone and not asking for help, that's why I want to talk about their service. So BetterHelp is the leading provider of online counseling, which is exactly what I loved about them is that it was online. And there's four ways that you can talk to your counselor. You can do a video session, there's phone calls, live chat, and messaging. And every counselor is licensed by their respective state and has over 3,000 hours of experience. BetterHelp is worldwide, so you can access them from any country, and there's counselors that will speak a wide variety of different languages. And you're going to be matched with a counselor within 24 hours or less. When being matched with your counselor, it's not a one-size-fits-all, so you do have the choices of picking the type of counselor. If you want a male or female counselor, if you want a counselor that's a little bit older, you are going to have options that fit your specific needs. You can message them anytime, day or night, and they get back to you in a timely fashion. What I also love is BetterHelp offers a broad expertise in their network, so it provides users with access to specialists that they might not be able to find locally. BetterHelp is not a crisis line, but it's a place where you can speak to a therapist if you are in need of help. The most important thing to me was the affordability, and that's exactly what BetterHelp is. They do make it affordable for people, especially in these times right now. And if you can't, they do have financial aid for those people that do qualify. So visit betterhelp.com slash bright side of life. That's betterhelp.com slash bright side of life. Join over 500,000 people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. And for your first month, you're going to receive 10% off by being a listener of the bright side of life. So let them know that I sent you by using the link betterhelp.com forward slash bright side of life. That's betterhelp.com forward slash B R I G H T side of life. The link will also be in the description section of this episode. Yeah. So where I was then, definitely not where I'm at now. And to say beautiful life, like to even think that I think that my life right now is beautiful is such a testimony to how cool God is. Um, so about a year ago, if you would have asked me a year ago, I would have said, I have everything. You know, I have everything I could need. I have, I'm married. We've been married 11 years. We live in this beautiful historic home. We have three kids, a dog, two cars, both, you know, um, steady careers. We are church going people and, you know, we are active in the church and we, we are, you know, just a great family unit. We get along really well with everybody in the family and we have, we have friends that we raise our kids with. You know, that's uncommon. But a year ago, I would have said, I have everything and I know exactly how my life is going to go because the past 11 years of marriage have, you know, shot us in this trajectory. And then, you know, it was about a year ago that he said, okay, I'm done. And, um, you know, there's two sides of every story Mm -hmm. and I don't discredit his side whatsoever. Um, I have definitely taken a long, hard look in the mirror at who I was and where I was at and how I could have been so much better or more loving in that situation but you can't go back and you can't walk in that condemnation you can't walk in that shame so you know i feel like that's been a really amazing thing it's been really hard and really painful to sit here by myself um you know when the kids are with him and with his family and just cry out to god and tell god like change me change me into who you want me to be and if i ever get a chance to do this again Help me to, you know, be what you call a wife to be or help me to be, you know, better for my kids and better for you. So 
who I was a year ago, I was very prideful and I didn't think I was, um, but really I was. And I was very confident and independent in myself, you know, dependent on myself to, to make up that life, you know, that everybody strives for. And, you know, God wasn't number one in my book and, you know, my husband and my kids and, and being a part of the church that all kind of came before him, you know, through all of this, through basically losing all of that, you know, losing, we moved shortly before he left. So I don't live in the same place. I had started a new job for a local school district and, you know, he left and I don't have any family in Missouri. So, you know, divorce divides to no fault of anybody else's. People pick sides, not that they're doing it maliciously, but I felt extremely, extremely alone. And in that time of being alone, where I lost my best friend and lost the family that I knew and the church group that I grew up in and or had done life with the past 11 years, you know, God really provided for me these amazing people that stepped in and said, we're going to love you and we're going to walk you through this and we're going to pray for you and we're going to encourage you and check on you and just really tell you that your story's not done and it's going to be good. And it will only be good if you trust God that his promises are good. And so throughout this time, I've definitely learned that God is my best friend and will see me through everything. Absolutely. Is that what is that what you feel has got you through your darkest days or what has gotten you through? Yeah, I would say just standing on the promises that he gives us. You know, I'm going to get churchy for a second, but like Romans 8.28 says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. And, and in Joel 2.25, it says, God can restore what is broken and turn it into something amazing. All you need is faith. And there's just so many like instances in the Bible and instances in my life. That's why I mentioned Shannon. That's why I mentioned, you know, finding out about being adopted and, and all of those things, because those were really tragic things in my life. But God taught me something every time. And every time I got stronger and every time I grew closer to him and really understood what really matters versus the superficial things we can all get caught up in. And so that's, that's what's gotten me through is, is clinging to what's good in life. And I love the name of your podcast, The Bright Side of Life, because I mean, in those darkest times, you have to like I would literally be sitting on my kitchen floor and just be sobbing and then tell God like this is awful and my heart hurts so bad but thank you that I'm healthy and thank you that my kids are healthy and thank you that I have a place to live and I just would start making these lists of things to be thankful for and that's that's what really got me through was to focus on things to be grateful for. Because when you start to think about what you're grateful for, you start to think about how much worse it could be. (laughs) And you don't want that. (laughs) Because it could always be worse. But it can always, you can change your mind and focus on the good. And that's, that's what got me through. And I fully believe that, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say a lot of people can't do that or it takes them a really, really long time to do that. You know, it could take them years and years and years of pain of, you know, suffering before they can even see that, you know, and, and even look at the bright side and then wonder, you know, why it's happening and not understand it. So I think it's, I think it's amazing that, you know, through this painful, painful year that you're already in that, that stage, if you will, of, I got to be grateful for this. I got to make a list. I mean, that's incredible because it doesn't happen like that for a lot of people. You know, it really doesn't. Yeah. And I've seen people go down dark paths, you know, they, multiple things happen to them or maybe one really traumatic thing happens to them and they turn to other ways of coping. And unfortunately I've had people close to me go down that path and it's not been productive. It's been very, even more painful. And, you know, at Churchy again, like I'm here for a reason and not to sound pompous at all, but like every person, they have a story, they have something that they're going to do that impacts other people and, and it's greater than themselves. Right. And so to give in and to, 
to lean into something like that, to lean into drugs, alcohol, or, you know, flippant relationships or whatever the case basically lets like the enemy win, you know, like you're, I don't know how to say it, but. I know what you're saying. I do. Don't ask me if I could word it. Cause I don't know if I could word it either, but, but I do understand what, what you're trying to say. Um, and that's, it's I mean, very. So, like Job, have you heard, have, have you, are you familiar with Job in the Bible? Uh, yes. But that doesn't mean I know everything he said. (laughs) (laughs) Me neither, but it's been funny. So when, when the pandemic hit and there was like the COVID shutdown, um, you know, people were like, oh my gosh, life sucks. And for me, I was like, I'm alone anyway, 50% of the time. So now everybody has to not hang out together because they're not allowed to. So it was almost a relief to me because I wasn't being left out of things. Um, so there's my, my grateful for COVID, but everybody (laughs) was, you know, so it was, it was a shock to them. And to me, I was like, put it on my tab, dude, because the past year I've like, I've changed houses, changed jobs. The pandemic completely changed my job, even though, because I work in a school Mm -hmm. now. And so my first year as a full-time school therapist completely changed and then going through a divorce, completely restarting friends and building that family within, you know, at that point I was like, what next? What else do you got? Because (laughs) this isn't, this isn't like too shocking for me because my whole, my entire life has changed in the past year um, for bad and for good though. Um, But Job, so I've really started reading and studying about him and, you know, the whole story starts because the enemy or the devil's like, Hey God, I don't think this guy is who he says he is. I think, I don't think he really has the integrity you think he does. I think if we took everything away from him and just basically destroyed his life besides killing him, he would turn his back on you and say, you know, and curse you and say, you're not as good as you said, God, like, I don't trust you anymore. And throughout that whole story, I mean, he lost all his kids. He lost all his wealth. He was the wealthiest man in this whole area. He lost everything. He was covered head to toe in disgusting boils and, you know, famine, all these things. And never did he say, I mean, he cried out in grief and sadness and anger, but he never said, I don't trust you, God. And he never turned his back on God. And, you know, so the enemy didn't win in that situation. And I've been so drawn to that and just thinking like, what I'm going through doesn't just affect me, it affects my kids and my friends and my close family and whoever else hears it. So if I give up and I turn my back, then then the enemy wins. And I, I'm too competitive. I don't like that. I got to persevere. And I know, I know that God is good. All the yeah. Time. It's not easy always to be strong. Um, there's, I mean, a quote that I completely always remember all the time is, you know, when there's no other option, you have to be strong because there has definitely been moments in my life where there wasn't, there was no other option. There just wasn't. And that, that was it. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this because that's, the, that's all there is. There's been nights when like things have been emotionally awful you know, between me and my ex and I have the kids at night and they're like, what are we having for dinner? And I'm like, well, guess I'm going to cook dinner crying, you know, cause that's, you just, you just do it. You, you just have to power through. So, yeah, you got a tattoo yeah. at the beginning of this year and I want to hear the story behind that. So I've always wanted a tattoo ever since, I don't know, I always wanted something, but I always told people I really want a tattoo. I don't know what I would get and where I would get it. And so if I'm ever going to get a tattoo, it needs to mean something. And I don't want it to be, you know, a a popular saying, or I don't, I really don't want it to be a Bible scripture, but I want it to to be a representation of who I am and what I've been through. And then I don't want it in a place where only I'm going to see it. And I also don't want to, I I work a professional job, so I also have to be able to cover it up. Right. Mm -hmm. On January 1st, I decided that this year is going to be, a year of new vision, like I'm changing my mind and um, choosing to see the good and to not let everything that's happened be what defines me. And if it does define me, I'm going to use it for good. And so I got a tattoo on my left upper forearm and it's of, when you just look at it, it's a circle and then it's got cracks in it, but it's a um, simple line drawing representation of Kintsugi which is the Japanese art form of restoring broken things. 
So in Japan, in their culture, if something breaks, like a, a plate or a mug or something like that, they don't just sweep it up and throw it away and replace it. They actually are pretty joyful and they replace, they put it back together and they fill the cracks with gold. Um, so that item can be like put up on a shelf or because it has a story to tell now. And they believe that when something breaks, despite it, you know, you could drop two mugs from the same from the same height and they're going to break differently. So they each have their own story. So I could be going through a divorce. Somebody else could be going through a divorce and we handle it very different ways. We break different ways, but there's still beauty and purpose through those stories. And I, I got it on my forearm because I wanted it to be visible and for people to say, Oh, what is that? You know, why do you have a circle on your arm? And I could just tell them the basic, you know, Oh, it's Kintsugi. And then they have the opportunity to say, Oh, well, why, why are you broken? Or, or what is that? Tell me more about that. Um, and that's actually been a really awesome, it started a lot of conversations with people that I didn't think would open up or would share. And I just feel like it's a, it's a fun way to, you know, get to know people if they're open to it. I think that is, that's incredible. Now I got to go get a tattoo <laughs> and do something like that. <laughs> You're right. Because you said it, it starts a lot of conversations that maybe otherwise wouldn't happen. That's kind of like the whole reason for this podcast is I love hearing stories of people's lives that I would never get to hear like before. Right. And I just get the opportunity for people to tell me their story. But if I would pass somebody in a grocery store, I would maybe never know that they're going through the through an awful divorce or they're going through, you know, a death of a family member. You you just wouldn't know. We don't we we don't just come to people and and like vomit all over them you know that scares people away so yeah you wouldn't know so nikki I, if go ahead oh um i was just gonna share one other thing my sister had she has a friend who makes like custom yarn designs yeah. and like the looms or the woven piece the tapestries to cheer me up. She had her friend make me one and, um, and her friend Laylee said, okay, just send me a picture that inspires you. So I sent her a picture of my tattoo and I didn't tell her anything else about it. Um, and so she, with all of her custom creations, she sends a letter with it about why she made the creation the way she did and what it means to her, what it represents. And there's just so much depth with it, but I love the way that she she described the tattoo and the meaning. Um, if I could share that. that okay? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love for you to. She said, for your piece, I was extremely inspired by the photo of your tattoo. The meaning of it is incredibly moving and I relate to it personally and artistically in so many ways. Rather than taking a literal approach to it, I decided to do something a little bit more abstract. First, I chose to use a round base for your piece. Circles have always represented God's love for the world and the people in it. There's no beginning and no end, which I definitely agree with. Mm -hmm. um, but I then felt like I should use my recycled 100% cotton rope when something is recycled, it is reshaped and molded, but ultimately becomes something so beautiful and new. And I believe that this is what God is doing with you. And she continued to say some of the embroidery that she did. She said, I wanted these cracks to be underneath because we grow from the things that crack and scar us even when they hurt. And then um, she said, the, you're strong and are making something beautiful from something terrible. Sorry, I can't. I thought I underlined more. But, <laughs> you're okay. But yeah. So I, I just really like the way she described that because, you know, when we're cracked, then the light can shine through. And before I thought I had it all and I didn't have such an exciting life. You know, I had three kids, a husband, a dog. And, you know, that's a lot of people's story. But now that I've been through something, it's just an opportunity to say, but God saw me through and God provided friends where I had no friends and family physically in this area where I had no family. And he, you know, gave me joy back. And, you know, I'm looking forward to everything. Like, I, if I ever get a chance ever again to, like, be in a relationship and be a wife, like, I know that I'll be, I won't be perfect, for sure. Positive. I'm way too sassy to be perfect. But. And um, it's not possible to be perfect. I've tried. <laughs> right. But I, I know I won't be perfect, but I sure as everything, you know, will be better. And just look forward to being able to have that opportunity again. Yeah. So do you have that uh, piece with you right there or no? Oh, she made um, you? 
yeah, you want me to go grab it real quick? Well, you can show me later, but I'd love to see it after the video. No, I do. It's it's so cool. It's um, There's more to the letter that she wrote with it, and it's gorgeous. And she's made them for my sister and then one of my other friends. And I truly believe she has a gift. You know, her people, everybody has a gift of, like, helping other people and ministering to people. And it's so beautiful to see you know, weaving her, her gift of weaving, like ministered to me tremendously during right. that time. Yeah. yeah. And, and I've, I've read this letter multiple times and I'm like, this girl doesn't know me, but she believes I'm strong. It's good. <laughs> well, also, cause I was wondering, I'm like, geez, how much does she know you? You know, she knows that you are extremely in your faith and all that stuff. Like it was very beautifully written how even just the short couple sentences that you read. So it is very cool you said that everybody has their gifts. And like you said, how would you think that weaving would turn into something that represents you as a person? You know? Yeah, that's, I mean, and I have it hanging in my room. And so every day when I leave my room, there's a little mirror and it's hanging right there. And it's like, I purposely put that next to it so that I could look in the mirror and say, that's who I am. You know, I'm, it's right next to the mirror. So when I look in and see my reflection, I say, like, I may have been broken, but I'm not, not useless. You know, it's, it's all going to be used for good. And it's all yeah. part of my identity, but it's going to be used for good. Absolutely. If you could give advice to someone that is going through a divorce or even just somebody that is going through a really dark time, what advice would you give them? I would tell them that they're not alone um, because that's a huge why that we want to believe about ourselves when we're going through a really dark time is that I'm, I'm the only one this has ever happened to and nobody's going to relate to me or or nobody wants to take this on. You know, sometimes when you are going through something really traumatic or really sad or just heavy, you think that you're a burden to everybody. But if those people truly love you and care about you, they're going to say "Uh uh-uh like we're not leaving you there like we're walking you through this and I'm extremely fortunate that I have you know Christian friends and that I do have faith in God and that has carried me and yeah just to know that you're not alone and don't try to do it alone we're not strong enough to do things alone if we were we wouldn't you know live in towns or be in relationships with anybody. That's extremely, really, really good advice. The last question that I have for you, Nikki, in your own words, what does the bright side of life mean to you? It means that I may not be able to say it without crying, but it's a happy happy (laughs) Not sad this time. Happy happy. tears, happy tears. (laughs) Just like joyful tears. Yeah. Um, that this life won't be easy, but if you can use the journey that you've been on to encourage and comfort others, that it's completely worth it. You just have to realize that there's always good, even in the darkest situations, and that's what gets you out of those dark situations, is focusing on the good, even if it's, you know, the smallest thing. Not every trial has an opportunity or every trial has been an opportunity for me to rely on God for strength. And it's made me who I am today. So that's the bright side of all of this is that I'm a better Nikki, a better mom, someday hopefully be a better wife um, and a better follower of God because I've been through all of this. Absolutely. And Nikki, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks for listening. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Bright Side of Life. I hope you enjoyed Nikki's story. I am so proud of her progress and just her perspective on life. It means a lot to me that you're here also. So if you like this or any of the episodes, be sure to subscribe. Lastly, if you know someone that may need to hear this story, please share it with them. We never know if this is the one that puts hope back in their hearts.